from Seattle, Washington, it's theCUBE, covering KubeCon and CloudNativeCon North America 2018. Brought to you by Red Hat, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, and its ecosystem partners. Okay, welcome back everyone. We're here live in Seattle for KubeCon and CloudNativeCon. I'm John Furrier, your host with Stu Miniman here, Wikibon. Our next guest, Anthony Lai, who's the Senior Vice President, General Manager, Cloud Data Services at NetApp, and Yancy Stefanson, CTO and VP of Cloud Services. Great to have you guys on. Great to see you again, Anthony. As always, thank um, you. So first, I want to get out there. I know we talked about this in theCUBE, just to reset, the value pressures of NetApp has significantly been enhanced with the cloud. What is that value proposition? What have you guys seen as that explosive headroom for value creation that you guys are enabling with NetApp in the cloud? You know, I think what NetApp has done uh, over now probably five years is really pushed itself to embrace the cloud, to recognize that the cloud is a very important part of everybody's IT infrastructure, whether it's an extension of the existing IT infrastructure for things like DR or backup, or whether it's, you know, the primary platform for legacy workloads or as we're all here to do to discuss the refactoring and rebuilding of applications around microservices. I think NetApp chose, uh, unlike all of the traditional storage vendors, to see the cloud as an opportunity and I think uh, it's helped the company and it's helped our customers to operate in, in what is, I think, by default now, you know, the end state for many companies is hybrid cloud. Yeah, and you guys also made some good moves early on, and with the cloud, we've documented certainly on SiliconANGLE and the Cube early on, and then as um, you know, Flash comes in for performance, now you got compute, mm -hmm. storage, and networking all being optimized in the cloud. Great app developers, an environment where it's programmable infrastructure, yep. finally. Yep. I Absolutely. mean, DevOps is happening. This is where services and notion of compute has gone from standing something up in seconds mm -hmm. on the cloud to with functions, milliseconds. So, yep. This is changing the dynamic of applications. You still got to store the data. Yeah, yeah. Talk about, uh, Yancy, about the impact of the services in, uh, piece to the developer, storage, services, provisioning, all that. Yeah, I mean, uh, we, we are taking, I mean, all of our services that are running in all the hyperscalers, in Google, in Azure, in AWS, and more, and even on-premise, our view is, our role is always to find the best home for any, for any workload at any given time even though it's in, in public cloud or in, or, in, or, in, uh, or, or on premise. However, storage has always been sort of left aside. It's always been move, living in this proprietary chunk that is hard to move and the weight of the data is actually quite heavy. So we actually want to use uh, uh, Kubernetes and microservices and persistent volume claims by taking that uh, uh, data and making that very easily migratable, replicated between locations, between hyperscalers, and sort of adopt a true multi-cloud strategy with data with it, not only moving those, uh, those uh, yeah. uh, workloads or applications, but the data is, is key. Yeah. Data I mean, is sometimes, key. Sometimes you, know, you want to move the, da the data to compute, and sometimes you want to move compute to the data. Yeah. yeah. And that's been validated by Amazon's yeah, RDS announcement on VMware, yeah. Amazon announced Outpost and on-premises, mm -hmm. and the number one thing was latency, workloads yeah, aren't yeah, yet yeah. moving. This yeah. is exactly to what you guys have been doing and implementing mm. today. This is like real product. You know, I, I think the reality of the world is, you know, while there is a ton of innovation that exists in public cloud, there are well-documented use cases that, that struggle with a cloud-only environment, and mm. I think NetApp has chosen to make each one of those three potential you know, persistent stores equal to one another. So whether that's you know, traditional on-premise and, and upgrading on-premise environments to get better price performance characteristics, embracing the public cloud or, or combining public and private cloud. Yeah, so while it's not trivial, NetApp at its core always was software. So moving yeah. it from you know, a hardware appliance, I mean back in the day, network appliance was the original name of the company to a mm -hmm. software defined solution to being multi-cloud. Mm -hmm. You can kind of see that, that genesis is where it can go. Uh, a lot of times the, the tougher part is fr from the customer standpoint. So, yeah. you know, the traditional person that bought and managed this was a storage administrator mm -hmm. and getting them to understand cloud native applications and DevOps and all those things are, you know, those are pretty challenging uh, moves. So, you know, how much of it is, 
education, how much of it is new buying centers inside the company or, or new clients? Uh, help us walk yeah, through Yeah, I that. would make two points and maybe on to two. So I think uh, NetApp's history actually, 25 years ago, NetApp started off selling into the developers who were running Sun workstations who wanted shared everything mm -hmm. and NetApp actually you know, went around IT and put those appliances into the developers. We built a sand business, a very successful sand business with the IT people. Now you're absolutely right, the people around here fall into the sort of the modern day DevOps uh, characters, the, what Google calls SREs, the Site Reliability Engineers, and they are a new breed. They're young, they're doing more and more CI, CD. Storage is, is an integral part of what they do, but maybe not a primary part. They expect storage to work. We, we are really lucky, you know, uh, a little company called Microsoft and another little company mm -hmm. called Google sell our stuff. Mm -hmm. So we get introduced into all of those cloud first, cloud only sort of use cases. Not just refactoring a primary, but building. Yeah. So we're actually in many cases now very relevant to those people, but we've been fortunate enough to leverage the big public clouds to get us Talk there. about the, obviously you have a relationship with AWS, Google, and Microsoft, Microsoft and Google, which you just mentioned. Mm -hmm. and you mentioned SRE, uh, yep. the Site Reliability Engineer. Mm -hmm. This is a new persona that's clearly emerging, and it has a focus around operations. Now, yeah. IT operations has been around for a long time. Yeah, Dev, that. Is, Dev well, is changing yeah. too, but this is an op if they sell your stuff, their customers need to operate at scale. Exactly right. This is a big point. Can you elaborate on the importance of this and what you guys are doing specifically to help that? So, the site reliability engineer, he is not doing operations. He is actually in, in charge of running the workload or the development or the application or the product that comes from development yeah. and they have to abide by specific rules that are actually set by the SRE. And to your point, because you were talking about different sell, selling motions and not selling into the storage admin or not selling to traditional IT, this is actually what has actually been really surprising and showcases the power of Kubernetes and how widely adopted it has been, both on-premise and in the public cloud. Because customers are actually coming to us and saying, hey, we had no idea NetApp was actually doing all of this in the public cloud. We had no idea that you had your own Kubernetes services that, that actually help solve one of the biggest problems, which is persistent volume claims and, and replication of data. So it's actually coming, and you, you sort of see how important CNCF is because they are actually educating the market and educating the enterprise space just as well as the new up and coming uh, development team like, like, like I've traditionally come from. So I'm actually seeing that, uh, that it's easier than, 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 uh, than I would uh, sort of uh, thought in the beginning. So they are actually becoming more educated about microservices, yeah. more educated about how to run. They are actually, everybody, almost in any company that I go into now, they have the SRE playbook. Uh, somewhere, in a meeting room somewhere, yeah, and everybody's yeah. sort of getting educated on how yeah. they need to have, uh, sort of uh, uh, elevate themselves from being traditional system administrators into that SRE or DevOps role. Yeah. And it's also a cultural thing too, they have to develop the, not just the playbook, but they yeah. got to have some experience yeah, yeah. in economies of scale managing it. And certainly it's a tailwind for you guys, mm -hmm. storage, because again, it's also a lot of coding involved, they need, they need a pool of resources, storage being one yep. of them. Mm -hmm. But the other thing that's interesting, those are single clouds, Amazon, mm -hmm. yep. Google. Multi-cloud is really where the action is, right? Yes. So multi-cloud is just, to me, a modern version of multi-vendor, yep. mm -hmm. which basically is just about choice. Yep. Yeah. Choice is critical, yep. but having choice around the app it becomes the value created, right? right? right. Yeah. So if you guys can scale with the app development environments, mm -hmm. that seems to be a sweet spot. How yeah. are you guys talking about that particular point? Because this becomes, and under the covers, um, oper a new kind of operations, mm -hmm. a new kind yeah, of scale, yeah, yeah. pushing code, not mm -hmm. just you know, stacking and racking boxes, but like really making things, patching security things, or Kubernetes had a security thing, so doing things really, really automated way. This is a yeah, I mean, I think the one thing that I'm most proud of at my time at, at NetApp, and, and what the team does, and what the team continues to do is, we took a very, very, uh, I think, deliberate perspective that we would deliver uh, storage, but we would do it in a very unique way. That, that my background was uh, from SaaS. I spent my entire career building applications. And when you build an application, you run the application. There is, 
There is nothing you give the customer and say, here, administer it. When you look at a lot of the infrastructure services, yeah. they make the customer do a lot yeah. of work. So what we did at NetApp was we, we decided that we ourselves would almost create like a, a, an always available protocol that, that yeah. people could just ask for it and it would be there. Yeah. That there was no concept of setting it up or patching it or upgrading it. And that's really, I think, we have set a bar now on the public clouds yeah. That, that, that I think even the public clouds themselves have not done. Yeah. And, and giving those developers that I, I asked for a storage through an API and all I need to do yeah. is ask for capacity and throughput. Nothing else? That, that's something to a developer they're like, so now I don't even have to ask anybody with storage skills. I, I can tell my application yeah. Yeah. to ask for its own storage. It's interesting, you're living in, in a, a new world where you need the scale of a system, yep. okay, but the functionality is like an app server. I mean, yeah, exactly. I feel like we're yeah. living in that app server days where mm. that's that middle ground and the app development was the key focus. Yep. 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 You got to have both now. You need scalable systems, but really application Absolutely. performance. And then, and then you add an additional layer because now everybody wants to be able to use the same deployment script, the same configuration management system, Terraform, whatever they are actually using to deploy, deploy it on premise or in a public cloud, but it needs to be done in a unified manner. And this is why it's so important to be upstream compatible. And uh, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, companies out there that are, that, are, that are actually destroying that model and not following the sort yeah. of uh, true cloud concept. Yeah, slap them on the wrist, give them a, you know, <laughs> get in line, fix yeah, it. Yeah, well, I mean, you if know. you're going to play in this space with the yeah. CNCF and with Kubernetes, you better play by the rules and do the open standards. Yeah. And so you're actually compatible no matter yeah. where your workload resides. Yep. So, we've, we've been monitoring how storage is maturing in this whole cloud-native Kubernetes yeah, yeah. ecosystem here. Yeah. A year ago, there were a lot of backroom arguments over what would the right architecture yeah. be. There's a, a few sub-projects working through here. Um, it actually blew me away in the keynote this morning to hear that 40% of all applications that are deployed in Kubernetes are stateful. Yeah. So where are we, what's, what's working, what's good for customers, and what do we still need to work on to kind of solidify the, the storage data uh, piece of, of this, uh, this stack? Yeah, I think it's interesting because I think uh, we sort of ourselves now sort of consider NetApp to be a data company. Yeah. Storage is an enabler, but what's interesting, everyone talks about their SaaS strategy, their PaaS strategy, their IaaS strategies. I always ask people, what's your data strategy? Mm -hmm. And that's something I think that, that the CNCF, Kubernetes themselves recognize that they've done a lot of really great things for compute around the microservices themselves, but, but the storage piece has always been something of a challenge. And, and we set about solving that problem. We, we have an open source project called Trident, that essentially enables uh, people to uh, make persistent volume claims, and if the container dies, they can essentially start a new container and pick up uh, the storage exactly where they left off. So, we, we really believe that, that stateful is an ever increasing uh, percentage of the overall application. Databases are important things. Yeah. People need them. Yeah, yeah, I would agree with that. And that's well, developing too, it's early, yeah. early on. All right, so I want to ask you guys a question, um, kind of outside the box. Multi-cloud certainly is part of hybrids, they call it hybrid today, it's really mm. a choice. Multi-cloud will be a future reality, um, no matter what anyone says, I, I believe that. How is multi-cloud changing IT investments? Business investments, technical investments, or both? What's your guys' thoughts on how multi-cloud is driving and changing IT investments? Well, I actually think it uh, offers you the opportunity to have like placement policy algorithms that fit your workload at any given time. For example, if this particular application is latency sen sensitive and I created an application that all of a sudden became really popular in Mexico, then I can, should be able to see which, hi uh, which one of the hyperscalers actually has a, 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 a presence in Mexico City, deploy it there. If I'm underutilizing my private cloud, and I, I have a lot of space on it, and there is no specific requirements, it gives you that flexibility to, all, like I said, like always find the best home for your workload at any given time. The dynamic policy based Th stuff? Yeah, precisely, and, yeah. And, and it allows you uh, also, I mean, you can, you can choose to do it whether it's uh, based on workload requirements, or you can start doing it in a least cost effective uh, route, I mean, do least, least cost routing. 
So it actually impacts both from a technical and a business sense, in my opinion. Yeah, and I think there's, you know, you, you cannot help but, you know, get excited every day with what one cloud delivers over another cloud. Yeah. And we're seeing, you know, something not unlike the arms race, you know. Google does this, then Amazon does this, then Microsoft does this. But well, maybe Amazon does this, everyone's going to be doing that. And <laughs> as developers, we're very keen to take advantage yeah. of all of these yeah, capabilities, and we want to, in many cases, let the application itself make the decision. Yeah. Great stuff, yeah, Amazon's yeah, got there, everyone's catching up. Competition's good. Yeah. yeah. All right, final question. Predictions for multi-cloud in 2019, what's going to happen? Is there going to be a loud bang? Is it going to be a crash? Is it going to be you know, fruit on the trees? What's the, what's the state of the multi-cloud predictions for 2019? Well, I actually believe it's going to become a standard. Uh, nobody should be locked into any any region or any in, uh, any one provider. I don't even care if it's on-premise or NetApp specific. You should be able to. Uh, 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 I mean, I think it's just going to become standard. Everybody has to have a multi-cloud strategy, and you can see that like the ITC report that 86% uh, that, uh, of Fortune 500 companies are, are adopting multi-cloud. Yeah. And I think uh, I'm actually quite fed up with this hybrid cloud stuff because in my opinion, on-premise is just the fourth or the fifth hyperscaler and should be treated as such. So if you actually have that true cloud concept, you should be able to deploy, deploy that yeah. using the same script, the same APIs, yeah. to deploy it everywhere. As yeah. I said on theCUBE, the data center and the on-prem, it's just an edge, yeah. exactly. a big edge. Yeah, precisely. <laughs> if it's an operating model, yeah, yeah. My your prediction, prediction. 2019 is the year of Istio. I think we, we've become enamored with Kubernetes. Yeah. I think what Istio brings is significantly advances Kubernetes. And we barely scratched the surface, I think, with the service mesh, mm -hmm. and all of the enhancements and all the contributions that will go into that. I think, you know, 2019 will probably, you know, see as many vendors here next year with, with Istio credentials and Istio capabilities as we see today with Kubernetes. Anthony and Yossi, thanks for coming on. Great insight, smart uh, commentary. Appreciate it, and we should get in the studio and dig into this a little bit deeper. Really a great example of an incumbent, large company, NetApp, really getting a tailwind from the cloud, mm. good smart bets you guys made, programmable mm -hmm. infrastructure, dynamic policy, routing, all kinds of under the covers goodness mm -hmm. from smart mm -hmm. cloud deployments. This is where software drives yeah. it, data. Yep, data, you know, data <laughs> is the new oil, that's what they say, right? Mm -hmm. you know, if Thanks. you don't have a data set, you're not very competitive. Thanks for coming on, I appreciate Pleasure. it. More CUBE coverage here, getting all the breakdown here, the impact of cloud computing at scale, the role of data software, all happening here. The CNCF, this is theCUBEcon. I'm John Furrier, Stu Miniman, thanks for watching. More live coverage after this short break. <laughs>